Okay. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started this evening. Thank you all for joining in. Uh, if y'all will, if you can open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, verse 16, and we're resuming our study of Paul's second missionary journey. And we're going to get started here. We're going to resume this uh, study of Paul. Uh, missionary journey tonight, uh, starting at chapter 17, verse um, 16. So in preparation for our study tonight, uh, let's spend a few moments of silent prayer. This would give us the opportunity to make sure that we are in a place to be taught by God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit desires to teach us, but he is hindered whenever we're out of fellowship. So let's spend a few moments of silent prayer to confess any unconfessed sins, and then we'll resume our study of the book of Acts. Let us pray. Father, we bow before you this evening. We first of all want to thank you for the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who you made to be sin for us so that we can be made righteous in him. In ourselves, we are unrighteous, but through Christ, we have been given your righteousness. In practice, we're yet to be righteous and we fail all the time, thanks to the indwelling sin nature. The Father, Jesus Christ died for our past, present and future sins. And on the basis of his work, we confess our sin and ask you to clean us so that we can fellowship with you and be guided and taught tonight by your spirit. Thank you for those who have come here to fellowship uh, with other believers, to learn your word, to fellowship in your word, and to be encouraged and challenged by your word. I ask that you'll bless them, uh, bless our time together. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 16. And we're continuing our study of the book of Acts, and we're looking at Paul's second missionary journey. And in our last class, we were looking at uh, Paul in Thessalonica and also Berea. And tonight we're going to see Paul's ministry in Athens his ministry in Athens. So we'll start, uh, and here Athens is a very dark um, city um, because of paganism. Uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a saying that say, uh, and the saying was, it was that in Athens, uh, uh, you will meet uh, God before you would meet men. In other words, they had so many gods in Athens. Every building and place uh, in Athens was a sanctuary for some pagan god. And so Paul is about to um, be very irritated and angry, uh, a righteous anger, not a sinful anger, because he's waiting on Timothy and Silas, who he left in Berea, and as he is waiting, uh, he is witnessing uh, the, the, the paganism um, uh, and the worship of so many different gods in Athens. Uh, so we'll start reading verse uh, 16. And so if I can get a volunteer to read um, verse 16 through, um, let's do, yeah, uh, 16 through 21. Can I get a volunteer to read 16 through 21, please, to get us started this evening? Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him, and some were saying, 
what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they look and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is, which you are proclaiming for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. We want to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. All right. So here we see Paul on his second missionary journey um, in Athens, uh, which is the capital of Greece. Um, and we see him redeeming the time. He's waiting for Timothy and Silas. He's redeeming the time. Now, Athens was the cultural and intellectual center of the Greek world. It was the center of art um, um, and also medicine, but it was uh, an education. The city of Athens was full, though, we see, of, of uh, full of temples and statues, which were places of worship or sanctuaries for all their different gods. It was a city of, full of idols. Um, uh, uh, it was a dark place. And whenever uh, a culture is saturated with idols, uh, that is Satan's headquarter because Satan is behind the worship of created objects. And uh, the temple and the statue were uh, considered idols by Paul because they they the the Athenians made these statues and these temple uh, as places of worship and sanctuary for all these different gods. Um, as I mentioned uh, 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 earlier, uh, it is said that in Athens it was so many temples and statues that it was easier to meet a god than a man. Man, that was a dark place. But Paul grew up as a Jew, believing that there is only one true God. He, he grew up a theist. And a theist is someone, uh, the, the word theology comes from the Greek word theos. And theos simply means the study of God. And so Paul uh, was a theist, meaning he believed and only one true God and, and Judaism. All Jews only believe in one true God. Uh, so he grew up believing in only one God and he was provoked within him to address an issue that he was witnessing as he was waiting on Silas and Timothy from Berea. Now this intellectual capital of the world was a place where idolatry was produced on every corner through the temples and the statue that represent sanctuary for all their different gods. So Paul is saying in verse one that he was uh, uh, provoked or irritated within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. So here we see his righteous anger, uh, but yet uh, he shared his heart um, uh, with the Jews, the Gentile, but also pagan Gentile when he say, and in the, uh, he, he uh, reasoned with the Jew, the God-fearing Gentile, meaning the Gentile that adopted uh, some of the uh, Judaistic practices. But then you had pagan Gentile also that he was reasoning with in his righteous anger. He had righteous anger. And, and, and righteous anger is not sinful anger. Anger is the kind of anger that Jesus had when he came into the temple 
and and he turned over the month the 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 money changers table because they had made God House a house of business and and where they sell their merchandise instead of a house of prayer. He wasn't sinning. That was righteous anger. And Paul have that same righteous anger here when they see when he see idolatry rampant in Athens. In verse 17, he continued his gospel ministry, however, right in Satan's territory among Jews and Gentile and pagans. In verse 18, it say, and also some of the Epicurean and Stoics philosopher were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idol babbler wish to say? Now, uh, 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 an idol babbler um, was someone, uh, they were considered uh, someone who plucked seeds uh, like a bird. Uh, that's what a babbler is, someone who uh, plucked seeds like a bird. In other words, uh, what he have to say is from a secondary source. So in other words, the information that Paul have to, to present is from someone else. It's not his own word. That is what they mean um, here about this babbler. Others, he seemed to be proclaiming a strange deity. He, he, he seemed to be proclaiming strange deity uh, because he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. He's preaching uh, uh, about some new God. Uh, and, and, and see, they didn't believe in um, the resurrection. So they accused Paul of uh, um, uh, uh, teaching about some uh, a different new God, a God that they're not uh, familiar with. Now, the uh, Epicureans, uh, the Epicureans, they are uh, a disciple of Epicurus, uh, who was a Greek uh, philosopher. And then you the Stoics here in, in verse 18. Uh, um, uh, they were follower of um, the guy, you know, another philosopher who taught um, uh, that knowledge of how the world works is how you find happiness. Um, uh, friendships is how you find uh, happiness. Uh, this is the Stoics. This is what they believe. They also, the Stoics also um, believe that um, that the all men's um, are 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 uh, part of the same family or the children of God. Where that's totally against the Bible. And they also were astro uh, astronomers. They were they believed in the, the the gods and the planets. Everything to them is God. Everything to them is God. God is in everything. This is where you get that idea that God is in everything and everything is God. And actually, this type of teaching is still um, around today. When you start hearing people saying that everything is God and and God is everything that comes from Athens. That comes from Athens. That philosophy, that idea, comes from Athens. Athens, from the Stoic philosophers. Um, and then in verse uh, nineteen, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, "May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming." Now, this, the Areopagus, was a court. It was a council with authority over religion and morals and education. Uh, and so they took um, Paul and brought him uh, to this court. And they wanted to say, hey, where, where are you getting this information from? What, where, what are these new ideas that you're proclaiming? In verse 20, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. In, in verse 21, we see that the Athenian's culture was such that the Athenians, they were so attracted to new ideas. They always met 
in the marketplace, uh, in the city center or the city square, um, uh, where all the debates take place at, to hear some new idea. Uh, they were savages for new ideas. And, and Paul was just a, another individual with new ideas, but he was teaching that there were some new deities, some new gods, and they were like, this is uh, uh, something new. Um, uh, tell us more about it. And then Paul is going to give uh, his sermon in verse 22. He's going to give his uh, sermon to these uh, Greek philosophers. And so let's, uh, I mean, the Athians. So verse 20, uh, 22, can I get someone to read verse 22 uh, through uh, 22 through 31, if you don't mind? I can read. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, that God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, and even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Amen. Thank you so much. So here we have Paul's sermon to the Athians. And the Athians, they were intellectual pagan. They were very smart intellectual pagans. They have uh, soaked their minds in so many different ideas and philosophies uh, from their uh, philosophers. And uh, in verse um, uh, 22, it say, uh, men, he said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious. Uh, in other words, they had reverence, uh, reverence for their gods. Every place in the public uh, was a sanctuary for their God. That's what he mean by you guys are very religious in all respects. In other words, you give reverence and, and fear uh, to all your gods. And Paul recognized that. And then in verse uh, 23, for while I was passing through and examined the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So here we see that the Athian had some knowledge about God, but they did not know him. They had some knowledge, but they did not know God. They were ignorant of God. And what Paul argument is going to be is, is Paul argument here is he's going to bring out uh, that God is uh, everyone's creator and that he will one day judge those who reject him. And that's what he brings out in, in verse 22 through 31. God is creator. God is judge. He will judge those who reject him. And men need to repent and look to faith in Jesus Christ, the one whom God will uh, judge all men through. So here he tell uh, them about God because he said they did not know God. 
And this God that did not know is one day is going to judge through the person of Jesus Christ. To an unknown God, God, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, what you worship, you ignorance here, what you worship in uh, uh, you do not know. Ignorance is when you don't know something. So they was worshiping a God that they did not even, they did not even know. They built an altar uh, to a God that they did not even know. And so Paul is going to give them a little knowledge about this God that they did not even know. And they had built the altar for. They had some sense of a God, but they did not know him. And therefore, Paul is going to give them some knowledge of this God that they did not know. And then he said in verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hand. I love this. Paul say, the God that you don't know, he do not dwell in temples made by human hands. In verse 25, nor is he served by human hands, although he needed anything, since he himself gives all life and breath and all things. In other words, the God that you do not know, he is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the sovereign creator. He is the sovereign ruler over all powers in the earth. Human temples can't contain him because he is the one true God who made all things. Human temples cannot contain him. And, and the true God sustains all things and he do not need to be sustained by anything that he have created. And that's in verse five. In verse 26, and he made from one man, speaking about Adam, every nation of mankind, every nation of mankind, he made from one man to live on the face of the earth. So here uh, he brings out that uh, there is no superior race because the Athians thought that they were uh, superior to all other peoples. You know, they, they thought that. But he brings out here that all men from every nation came from one man, Adam. One man, Adam. And, 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 and when God created all uh, Adam, and, but he created every nation to live on the face of the earth. Uh, a very uh, a powerful point here is what Paul is saying in verse 26 is that God's plan determined that man will live on earth, not other planets. You know, men are still today trying to uh, find life on other planets. And they're finding out that other planets cannot, uh, life um, uh, uh, cannot exist on other planet. Why? Because God determined that man would live on earth, not other planets. And it say, having determined their appointed time and the boundaries of their habitation. So here Paul say, God have determined that man will inhabit earth and not other areas of the planets. And so uh, in verse 20 and then 27, that they would seek God if perhaps he might group for him and find him, though he is not far from, um, um, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. So we see here that the Greek poets is the one who came up that idea that we all, uh, the, 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 uh, the brotherhood of man. Uh, in other words, all men are brothers uh, and that God is the father of all men. Well, God is not the father. He's the creator of all men but he's not the father of all men. 
He's not the father of unbelievers. He's not the father of atheists. He's not the father of agnostics. Uh, he is only the father of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Now, he's the creator of all men, the sovereign creator, but he is not uh, uh, the father of all men. And we all are not serving the same God. In verse 29, being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. So if, if y'all believe that God is the, uh, that all of us are the children of God, then why do you think, why do you think that God's divine nature is gold or silver or stone? None of that is living. God is a living God. And if you are saying that you guys are his children, then why are you uh, uh, worshiping or, or engraving uh, 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 um, uh, statue? Why are you making statues made out of silver and gold and saying that this is God? This is idolatry. Then he say, an image formed by the art, art here is in engraving work, and the thought of man, the thought of man here, the content of man's thinking and reasoning. So in other words, man have his own concept of God through art. So in Athens, that's why they say Athens is the, the center of art. Art originated in Athens. Yes, but that's because Every single public place and statue was a sanctuary uh, of their God. It expressed the imagination or the, the concept that the Athens had of who and what God is through their own human reasoning. And, 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 and we should never, uh, God have revealed himself, and, but men have created images and statues and from their own intellect and ideals um, have said, this is who God is. This is who God is, and that's not who God is. And verse, and look on that verse, the next verse, verse 30, it say, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, here we see that God overlooked, the word overlooked carries the idea of uh, overlooking severe punishment, in other words, because of his grace, God see men worshiping idols, man-made images and statues, create sanctuaries for him as tem and temples. He see all that and he should punish man for idolatry, but because of the work of Jesus Christ, he spares man. He overlooked their ignorance. He overlooked, he said, they don't even know. They're ignorant. So because of Christ's work, he overlooked it. But then it say, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent or change your mind. So now God say, change the word repent here means change your thinking. So God overlooked severe punishment on the Athens is what Paul is saying. God have overlooked punishment, severe punishment for your idolatry. But now God is declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, change your thinking, which will lead you to uh, uh, turning from false worship to God, the true God through Jesus Christ. In other words, you reject it by serving idols, you have rejected the creator, you have rejected God, and now you need to turn from false worship to God through faith in the gospel message. And why you need to turn and repent, verse 31, because he has fixed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. 
So Paul brings out here to the Athens that uh, the creator who y'all have rejected through your idol worship is one day he have overlooked severe punishment right now, but one day he's going to judge through Jesus Christ, all men who have rejected him. And so you need to repent. And the one that he's going to, that's going to be the judge resurrected from the grave, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and, and go to, if you will, go to Romans. This brought me to go to Romans chapter, uh, chapter one, because what Paul is doing here is showing the pagan Gentile world here in Athens that you guys are condemned by God. God just have not executed severe punishment because of the work of Jesus Christ, but one day, the one who resurrected is gonna judge you, you need to repent. Now, why do God judge the Gentile, uh, the Greeks? Uh, well, the same reason he judged all Gentiles. Yes, they're ignorant, but God have not left himself without witness. No man could claim ignorance, say, I was ignorant, I did not know. No, God has revealed himself to all men. No one is going to have excuse for rejecting God. Go to Romans chapter one, and here's why men are not going to have any excuse when Jesus judged the unsaved person. Go to chapter one of Romans verse 18. Romans chapter one, verse 18. Verse 18 say, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So here in verse 18 of Roman, we see that God reveals his righteousness through his wrath. And verse 19 say, why? Because that which is known about God is evident or manifested within them. For God made it manifested to them. So in other words, God would judge man not because of what he don't know, but God judged man because of how he respond to what God has already revealed. See, all men have some knowledge of God because all men see creation. All men see creation, and creation tells us, no matter who you are, creation tells men that there is a creator and maker of all things. Now, that person can respond positive, or he can choose to reject that knowledge of God and become an atheist and say, I don't believe that there is a God. Well, that's not gonna, that's not gonna uh, uh, cause you to as be able to escape hell because God had revealed himself through creation. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Now, Paul is talking about the pagan Gentile world. They have no excuse. They can say we were ignorant, we did not know, and God going to say that is no uh, excuse because I revealed myself through creation. You saw creation, and creation revealed that there is a creator. And then he said in verse 21, for even though they knew God, here are pagans, those who did not even have the Mosaic law, which was God's revelation, even they have revelation given to them by God. And, and say they knew God. They knew God in creation. Now, they didn't have a full knowledge of God, but they had some knowledge. But they must respond to that little knowledge before God would provide more knowledge, meaning they must say, I believe that there is a creator. And once they believe that, then God said, I'm going to provide inf more information, more revelation so that you can be saved. But they must be positive toward the existence of God before God will give them more revelation. 
All right, and verse 22 say, professing to be wise, speaking of the pagans, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creature. So here we see that when the pagan Gentile world reject the existence of God, they got to worship something. And so what they do, they create things with their hands, statues and images of animals and created things, and they worship those things as God. And, and, and that is what Paul is dealing with. So it was a very, Athens was a very dark place. And Paul was revealing the one true God and the false worship of the Athens. And he told them, you need to repent because God is going to judge one day. All right, let's go back to um, Acts 17. You know, this sermon here reminds me of even today. You know, when you see people begin to adopt uh, things that the word of God, as their practice, the thing the word of God condemned, like homosexuality, uh, adopting that lifestyle is just a sign that men have rejected their creator. Because what happens is when you don't believe that God exists, when there is unbelief, then men have no way to measure right and wrong. And so they decide for themselves what is right and wrong from their own reasoning. And, and, and that's what you have. And we, we see it in Romans 1 that when men reject God's existence and begin to worship created things, then morally speaking, they become immoral. So rejecting God leads to immorality. And that's why you see so much immorality in our culture and every culture that is walking in unbelief, uh, that culture is saturated with immorality. I went to uh, India and in India, man, you can, when you go to India, they have so many temples and uh, to all these different gods and they got, they make God, they got actually millions and millions of gods represented by cow statue of cows and animals and all kind of weird stuff. Uh, but also when you have that type of idolatry, that is Satan's territory. Satan is at work and you can sense it. You can sense the demonic activity when you go to a place like India and then the immorality is rampant as well, because that's what follows rejecting God as the creator. And that is what Athens looked like. It was a very dark place because of idolatry. Verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, we're in, uh, back in Acts chapter 17, verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were uh, 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 Nicias and Arapagite, and a woman named Demiris and others uh, with them. And so here we see Paul come into a, he redeemed the time. What I, what I like, uh, Paul did not give himself a break. And, and Paul was a man that had the heart of God. When he sensed idolatry, he saw the need to give these people the truth. And we as Christian today, we shall have that same uh, righteous anger. When we sense idolatry in our culture, we should have a strong desire and passion to present the gospel with those who are in Satan's domain of darkness, like the Apostle Paul is doing here. He is presenting the truth to these people who are in the dark. You know, we are living in a very dark time uh, today. I see idolatry everywhere where people worship creation 
rather than the creator. And whenever you see a society worshiping the things that are in this world more than they worship God, that is that show that Satan has a stronghold in that area. And the only thing that can set people free and break that stronghold is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we need to present truth to people because that's the only thing that can release people like the Athens from Satan's stronghold. Because if they don't get re uh, released, then unbelievers will be judged and condemned to spend eternity in the lake of fire if they die without Christ and without accepting the truth. All right, so when we come back, we're going to go into Paul's ministry in Corinth, and we'll stop here. We won't, we won't go into Corinth right now, but when we come back, we'll go into uh, his ministry in Corinth and also his ministry in Ephesus. And he wrote letters to both of these churches that he's planning, uh, Corinth and Ephesus. And that's his letters in the epistles. All right, let's start right here. Any questions or comments about Paul's ministry in Athens? Any questions or comment about Paul's ministry here in Athens? Any questions or comments? It was, it was very um, of the Lord how Paul was very respectful while he was there and actually commended them on being religious, I mean, worshiping, but um, used that to, to reach them. So I thought that's good for us to be respectful of other people that don't know the one true God mm -hmm. and um, help them to yeah. understand that there is a one true God that uh, they can know. Amen. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's a good point. You know, we like to be mean, and I'm speaking about Christian, with people that don't believe like we believe. But here we see Paul being very respectful, like you say, and gracious um, of their religion, even though they did not have the truth. And, and that, that opened a door for Paul. That opened a door for him to be able to witness to those people. And if we're not respectful um, toward other people's belief, even though it's, they're in the dark, uh, then we may, the, their heart may be closed and they may not even want to hear nothing that we have to say. So yeah, that is a, a good point there is to be respectful of other people's religion and their faith. Uh, and sometimes just hear them out and let them share with uh, you what they believe. And then you just be armed with truth and then just give them the truth. And most likely they're hear what you got to say uh, when they see that respect. Um, uh, so thank you, Becky, for bringing that out. Anybody else? Any questions or comments? I just know, Pastor, that some people, when you see things and don't believe in, in what you believe in as Christians, even though you see what they're doing is not, you know, according to the word, you sometimes just go and accept it for fear of um, not um, being part of the group. So even though you just see it, you just don't say anything. Oh, right, I, right. I, I think, and I think you ought to just be open and be prepared and knowledgeable enough to show it to them, show them the word and show their correct word with them. Yep. We're supposed to do that. We're to expose that which is in the dark. And like you say, sometimes we co compromise our faith in what we believe just to be accepted yes. by others and our peers. And that's huge in our day and time right now. So uh, that's true. We should share the truth with them. You know, we love them. We're not to be tolerant. We're not to be tolerant. Like homosexuality and all those, that's clearly mentioned in the Bible. And uh, and I don't see any reason why you have to go around and accept it if that's not really your faith. They, you know, believe as a Christian, you should be able to openly speak about it and speak against it if it's not the true word. Yeah, exactly. In love, in love, we're to and respect. We're to we're, 
when I say respect, just people, we got to love the sinner, but we can hate the sin and we can have the same heart that Paul had. You saw how he, he was agitated and irritated when he saw the idolatry in this city, everything that is totally against his faith. And we too should share God's heart when we sense idolatry, when we sense homosexuality or any sin in our midst. We're not to be judgmental and religious or legalistic, but we're not to compromise. Not to compromise, exactly. All right. Well, thank y'all so much for your comments and 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 um, and we got a couple more minutes. Anybody else? Any comments or question? If not, we'll close in prayer. All right. Let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. All right. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're just so grateful uh, for you um, preserving your word so that we can learn about these men like the Apostle Paul and their missionary journeys who they teach us so much about how to be missionaries and how to be bearers of your truth uh, in a very dark world. And uh, thank you for preserving uh, these men's life and walk with you and their ministries and help us you know, to not compromise our faith when we are in the midst of a dark paganistic society and culture um, but help us to share the truth um, because maybe there's somebody that may respond uh, to that truth. But if we don't stand for the truth, then people uh, will stay in darkness, but we're called uh, to be missionary. We all are. And so, and what we say and what we do. So help us and give us the courage, uh, the courage uh, that Paul had to share truth with those who are in the dark and those who are suffering for lack of truth. As your words say, my people are destroyed for lack of accurate Bible teaching. Help us, Lord, to share the truth that we know with others. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, y'all have a good night. And Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Good weekend. You're welcome. Amen. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.